welcome to the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. This podcast focuses on financial planning and investment topics. Our goal is to help you make better financial decisions. We are fierce advocates of fiduciary advice. What does fiduciary mean? It means that anyone who advises you should always put your needs first. We hope you get some value from this episode. Thanks for listening. Standard housekeeping, anything on the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast should not be considered individual financial planning or investment advice. For that, we recommend you consult your own properly registered and licensed professional. Welcome back. This is episode 28. I'm Brian Beasley, and with me again is Dan Alberth. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. We've been discussing The Psychology of Money, the book by Morgan Housel, one of the books I most highly recommend to folks. If if you have a chance to get that book, please get it. This is part three. And if you have not already listened to episodes 26 and 27, please do so. That'll be very helpful. In episode one, we talked about this formula that was in the book. Happiness is equal to your results minus your expectations. And the bulk of episode one and two, we really focused on maximizing those results. And the way we talked about doing that is you want to participate in the markets for as much as possible, for as long as possible. Anything that you can do to increase the amount you're participating or increase the length of time you're participating is tends, tends to be beneficial. But at the same time, you need to avoid ruin at all costs. Because once you're ruined, once you're, you're out of the game, so we can't, you can't lose, you can't die financially, if you will, and still stay in the game. In this episode, we're going to finish up that part of the equation. We're going to focus on expectations. And the other factor was uh, increasing your feeling of control right into the book. Continuing on the, the topic of humility. And you mentioned this in episode one. Wealth is what you don't see. If you spend money on things, you will end up with the things and not the money. Rich, as he defines it in the book, is current income and wealth is hidden. It's income that wasn't spent. The danger here is that I think most people deep down want to be wealthy. They want freedom and flexibility, which is what financial assets not yet spent can give you. But it is so ingrained in us that to have money is to spend money that we don't get to see the restraint it takes to actually be wealthy. And since we can't see it, it's hard to learn about it. We talked about this in episode five, you know, Dr. Thomas Stanley, when he wrote his book, the millionaire next door and the book we covered, stop acting rich and live like most millionaires. The challenge that Morgan's saying we have is we have trouble finding role models for developing wealth and accumulating wealth and keeping the wealth. Because as he said, we saw him on a, on a podcast. If you see somebody who's in good shape physically, you can kind of tell. Oh, that person's in good shape. You see somebody who's not in good shape. It's, it's readily visible. But it's really hard to tell who's wealthy. Because they're not all putting it out there for all to see. He says, if you see someone driving a $300,000 car, all you really know about that person is one of two things. Either they have $300,000 less than before they bought the car. Or they have an income high enough to support the payment. But it doesn't tell you their net worth. It doesn't tell you their financial security. It doesn't tell you the amount of control over time that they have. But one of the things you can do is just recognize, hey, wealth's hard to learn about because it's invisible. So where should your expectations be? Should it be the $300,000 car? We talked about in episode five, and I'll mention it again. The people that think that's wealth, when they get money... They immediately spend it on that luxury lifestyle. And you and I have had clients, many, most of our clients that are very, very wealthy, who have the actual wealth and the freedom and the time that that buys. You would never, ever guess what they have. You'd never, you would never have guessed it. They buy modest vehicles and live modest lifestyle. They're they're very comfortable too. This isn't like, this isn't the person that's, This isn't like the story of the homeless person that left millions of dollars to charity. There's a happy medium in there. You're you're not either living like a 
homeless person or you're Richie Rich. There's an in-between zone where you can be very frugal, living way beneath, beneath your means and still live a very comfortable lifestyle. But regarding expectations, last chapter we talked about room for error. And he talks about this. He goes, use room for error when estimating your future returns. If you're trying to minimize your expectations, when you're projecting out in the future and you're working with that retirement calculator or you're working with your advisor and doing that financial plan, looking out 10, 20, 30, 40 years of your life, one thing you can do that Morgan talks about in the book is Assume you're going to earn less than average returns. Does that mean that you should expect to get below average returns? Well, you hope you get average returns or better. Everybody hopes that. But as we learned in the last couple of episodes, surprises happen. If you expect to earn less return, you're more likely to save more. If you save more and you end up with average returns then that's what you'd get what we, that's when you would get what we'd call a happy surprise oh wow we actually can retire sooner oh wow we can actually have a higher income in retirement oh wow we can f- solve that injustice that we see in our own community or our own family's life you just have options there's not a lot of downside i guess the only downside is Maybe because you're saving more, maybe you buy a slightly less expensive car or a less expensive home. But that doesn't mean you're living in a tent or living in a van down by the river. Hmm. This back to the book. At a party by a billionaire on Shelter Island, Kurt Vonnegut informs his pal Joseph Heller that their host, a hedge fund manager, had made more money in a single day than Heller had earned from his wildly popular novel, Catch-22, over its entire history. Heller responds, Yes, but I have something he will never have. Enough. The hardest financial skill is getting the goalpost to stop moving. You need to define what enough is for you. When you do that, Number one, it changes your focus of your mind on instead of more, 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 it's life, relationships, the benefits of life, you know, going out and making a difference in the world, doing the things that you want to do when you want to do them on your own terms. And this relentless pursuit of more, 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 better, better, better is probably not healthy. So if you can lower your expectations to at least, or at least get to the point where you know when enough is enough. We have, we've had clients where they had every opportunity based on their income to retire before they were 50 years old if they wanted to or to be completely financial fr- financially free before they were 50. And yet they would spend more than 80% of what they earned and they're going to work till they're 65 or longer. And maybe that's what they want. I'm not saying that some people out there that they, they're fulfilled by what they do for a living and that's great. But you have the ability to have more options, and yet you still don't do it. That's a challenge. It's hard to watch sometimes. More, more, more does not always equate to happiness. No, a lot of times it ends up with stress, stress, stress. But again, just for back to expectations, understand also related expectations, and this is just me inserting on this topic. Process, process, process. Understand that processes take time. And if you focus on the right process, eventually the odds are in your favor. Understand the role of risk and luck in everything. You can't just look at the last six months or the last year or heck, even the last three years and really have a good clue about whether that thing you're doing is a, is a good process. There's other criteria to understand what good process looks like and what bad process looks like. If you focus on process and you're 
doing things over a long period of time, it'll change your expectations and increase the likelihood that you stick with what your good process is. And if you stick with a good process, you tend to get rewarded over time. It's just how it works. But when people shorten their time horizon and they don't understand how processes in investing work, that's when mistakes can be made. Control. Angus Campbell was a psychologist at the University of Michigan. Campbell wanted to know what made people happy. The most powerful common denominator of happiness was simple. You know what it was, Dan? What was it? Control. From the book, money's greatest intrinsic value, and this can't be overstated, is its ability to give you control over your time. Money's greatest intrinsic value is its ability to give you control over time. So on the surface, I just say, hey, so don't let your money or your investing strategy suck all of your time away. You know, we've seen a lot of people get into investing in the last, say, the last year or so who had some great experiences. And I've seen even people have said, hey, I'm doing so well. I've quit my job because I'm going to spend all my time day trading. And in that same vein, I'll see people that will post how stressed out they are worrying about their trades. Because they're doing it wrong. It's outside their comfort zone. It's outside their level of expertise. And yet, a little bit of success can convince somebody that this is the thing. And if there's people out there that maybe legitimately are that person, but it's kind of like going to the NFL. The odds aren't in your favor. If it was that easy to do so well in investing, then, again, active managers would be absolutely crushing the stock market indexes. And they don't over time. Check your ego. you got to check your ego. Maybe you were lucky. But also just recognize, you know, money, when he's talking about money and happiness and control of time, I mean, that's, that's where it's at. If you've got a little bit of money, you can take a little extra unpaid sick leave when you're actually sick and come back to work when you feel well. There's a lot of people that go to work sick and their sickness drags out for weeks or months on end because they never really got well because they couldn't afford to take the time off. A little bit of money can give you the patience to, he talks about this in the book, a little bit of money can give you the patience to wait for the right job to come along instead of settling for the first offer you get. Maybe you can choose to work someplace where you have more flexible hours so that you can be there for your family if you need to be. Maybe, you know, and ultimately, you know, you have enough money, you can be financially independent and do what you want when you want on your own terms. Even if you choose to be an entrepreneur and work or volunteer, you're working on your terms instead of because you have to pay the bills. And that's a whole nother day at work. When, when we have the ability to tell somebody in their 50s, hey, you could retire now if you wanted. That's just an awesome feeling. And I've had the opportunity to tell a, a few people that over the years. And it's really exhilarating to sit down with somebody and say, you know what? You could retire now if you wanted to. As we keep up with several of them, it changes their outlook. When they go to work, they have a different outlook. And they have actually become much more successful in With some cases, knowledge. yeah, yeah, just just that that freedom of that stress has made a beneficial change in their lives, even if they continue to work. So we want to focus on controllable factors. That's one of our eight pillars. Mm-hmm. One of those controllable factors is this: you know how much and how often you invest. Morgan talks about in the book here. Past a certain level of income, people fall into three groups: those who save. Those who don't think they can save and those who don't think they have to save. This is for the latter too. Building wealth has little to do with your income or investment returns and lots to do with your savings rate. Personal savings in frugality, finances, conservation, and efficiency are parts of the money equation that are more in your control and have a 100% chance of being as effective in the future as they are today. The value of wealth is relative to what you need. 
when you define savings as the gap between your ego and your income, you realize why many people with decent incomes save so little. I'm going to read that one again. When you define savings as the gap between your ego and your income, you realize why many people with decent incomes save so little. Savings can be created by spending less. You can spend less if you desire less. And you will desire less if you care less about what others think of you. It's as simple as that. Why do people drive a flashy car? He talks about this in the book. Why do people drive a flashy car? They drive a flashy car because of what it says about them. They've made it. They're somebody. Sometimes it's just for fun because it's a cool car. You want to drive it fast. But a lot of times it's a status symbol. It's not performance. It's just a status symbol. But the funny thing he talks about is this. There's, there's this paradox. When you see someone in a flashy car, you simply see yourself in that car. You're ignoring the person inside or you're judging them. And you don't know. You don't ask, hey, I wonder how disciplined they've been with their money. Wow, they must be really disciplined. They must work hard. I wonder what kind of thing they did. Oftentimes what people will do is they'll say, oh, they probably made it, a quick, made it quick and easy. Oh, it looks like somebody won the lottery or I must have done well in Vegas or they, they hit a hot stock or lucked out on cryptocurrency trade or something like that and they got it real quick. Rarely do you really think that hard about the person driving that flashy car. And yet, when you buy a flashy car, you think that that's, a, that's, a, that's signaling to everybody else about how hard you worked. You know, the sacrifices you've made and how you've, people aren't thinking about that. So it's just an ironic thing there. Question I would have is, would you rather be extremely comfortable, stress-free, and happy? Or would you prefer to be rich, famous, and miserable? I prefer the former. I would prefer to be happy uh, we at have- a lower level. We have clients, I've had clients in the past, when they got bonuses or they got raises, they didn't increase their savings. They immediately did everything they could to spend that money. They upgraded, they bought a new house, they got a boat, they bought a newer car. And uh, as we were talking about before, with uh, stress, and happiness that just because you're you're making more money than you did before if you're spending it all now you've got more monthly payments to pay for all these toys that you've purchased and you're going to be just distressed you're you're just broke at a higher level so to speak yes so you can control how much you contribute again going back to how do we maximize our results you participate in the markets for as long as possible and as much as possible. Well, the as much as possible comes from you contributing more and saving more. So you can control that. That's a big controllable factor. If you're doing that right, you're just going to feel better. Another thing you can control. This is a little trickier. Your mindset. Back to the book. Minimizing future regret is hard to rationalize on paper, but easy to justify in real life. A rational investor makes decisions based on numeric facts. A reasonable investor, so he's talking about rational versus reasonable. A reasonable investor makes them in a conference room surrounded by coworkers that you want to think highly of you, with a spouse you don't want to let down, or judged against the silly but realistic competitors that are your brother-in-law, your neighbor, and your own personal doubts. Investing has a social component that's often ignored when viewed through strictly financial lens. So this is, this is just gigantic. We, we see this an awful lot. You've got, you've got the optimal plan we were talking about earlier. Oh, you know, go to an advisor and they're going to try to put together the optimal plan that for your core of your portfolio, that's going to maximize the odds of success over time. If they're really doing it properly and following best practices. And yet, you know, that's all rational. That's all math. 
but there's this there's this emotional human component you have to take into account is that people have this they want to be able to justify their decisions to the people who are maybe along for the ride whether that's their children or people observing from the sidelines like a neighbor or a friend and they're interacting with them at a party and somebody says, well, I made blah, 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 blah last month because I invested in X, Y, Z, or all I'm buying is dividend stocks. All I buy is cryptocurrency. All I buy is tech stocks. All I buy is CDs. All I buy is bonds, whatever it is. That's gonna have an effect socially on every investor. So what should people do? Back to the book. We should avoid the extreme ends of financial planning. Assuming you'll be happy with very low income or choosing to work endless hours in pursuit of a high one increases the odds that one day you'll find yourself at a point of regret. Aiming at every point in your working life to have moderate annual savings, moderate free time, and no more than a moderate commute and at least moderate time with your family increases the odds of being able to stick with a plan and avoid regret than if any one of those things fall to the extreme sides of the spectrum. Boy, how often have we not heard that? We Somebody's working hard to support their family and they're working hard and they're traveling and they're, they're, they're gone all the time working hard. It's all for the family. They're paying for everything and they, find, they come home and they have no family anymore. Or on the flip side, the person who's always there for their family, always around. And next thing you know, they don't have a job because they were taking too much time off. They weren't, didn't feel committed. It's about a balance. The three-legged stool, so to speak, or some What's people the third call leg? it the third leg is healthy. Be, live a healthy life and be healthy, have healthy relationships and being financially healthy financially well to do and some people put a fourth leg on that stool of spiritual health and, and each one feeds the other you need all three you need that balance to be complete if you want to feel fulfilled and what people are always searching for is that you know um, yet some people who are completely having money problems and stressed out all the time but it's because they're working out all the time they're in phenomenal shape but they have no money and no financial security you have other people who have all kinds of money and their health has gone to pot or their marriage has gone to pot. And you, you've, you've got to have a balance between those three things. Back to the book. We should also come to accept the reality of changing our minds. What he's talking about here is, hey, just like we saw surprises in the past episode, life will evolve and you will change too. Your job could change, your career could change, your income could change, up or down. We've seen both. Your priorities could change. And a lot of people get stuck mentally. We're talking about mindset here. A lot of people get stuck because of that inertia. They're like, I'm just this kind of a person or whatever. And they're, they're, they're leery of changing and adapting to the new situation they're in. We've seen people who bought an investment fund that was really not that great, and they just had trouble getting rid of it. Or they inherited something that needed to be replaced because it was outside of what made sense for them. But they just couldn't adjust to it. Or the aggressive portfolio that built their wealth is now too risky to reliably fulfill their, their retirement income. So it's important just to realize that what he's trying to, I think what he's trying to get to is that life's going to change. And so be okay with that. Your priority is going to change. But what he's not saying here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but he's not saying it's okay to change your mind at the drop of a hat because of what's going on in the markets in the last week. Oh, the markets are up, therefore I want to take more risk. Oh, the markets just went down, I want to get conservative, which I would deem buy high and sell low. That's not what he's talking about. You shouldn't be bouncing around changing your strategy every month, every quarter, every year or two because of what just happened. Because then you're falling prey to that mistake of looking at things too short term and not focusing on process. You're just focusing on outcome. When you have a life change, like a death in the family or a change in career, your objectives and your financial plan may have to adjust along with that change. 
that's what I believe he's speaking to. Yeah, it's the big things that that actually are life impact type stuff, not just responding to the winds and the weather in the short run. You know, also keep in mind that people are playing different games. He hits on this pretty hard. Back to the book here. When a commentator on CNBC says you should buy this stock, keep in mind that they do not know who you are. Are you a teenager trading for fun? An elderly widow on a limited budget? Are you a hedge fund manager trying to shore up your books before the quarter ends? Are we supposed to think that those three people have the same priorities and that whatever level a particular stock is trading at is the right for all three of them? Define the game you're playing and make sure your actions are not being influenced by people playing a different game. Smart, informed, and reasonable people can disagree in finance because people have vastly different goals and desires. There is no single right answer, just the answer that works for you. Again, there's no right answer. There is no universal truth. There's only what works for you and your family. Checking the boxes you want checked in a way that leaves you comfortable and sleeping well at night. Every investor should pick a strategy that has the highest odds of successfully meeting their goals. I don't care if it's your neighbor. I don't care if it's a coworker or a relative that makes exactly the same income as you, has the same number of kids with you, drives the same cars, lives in the same neighborhood in the same floor plan. Their financial needs and goals and psychology is going to be different than yours. Understand. If you're online in a discussion group, for example, and you say, hey, should I buy this or not? No one can answer that question very well because they're all playing the slightly different games than you. You need to know yourself, and that's one of our first pillar. You need to understand your own psychology. You understand your own risk tolerance, your risk capacity, your goals. All those things are so critical. Go back and listen to episode four if you haven't listened to it. You need to know yourself so that you at least know what game you're playing. And try to avoid the syndrome of trying to keep up with the neighbors, keep up with the Joneses, as I've heard it called. It's huge. It's that kind of stuff that gets in the way more often than not. So some more on humility here. I don't know what I don't know. So I'm just as susceptible to explaining the world through the limited set of mental models I have at my disposal. We all want the complicated world we live in to make sense. So we tell ourselves stories to fill in the gaps of what are effectively blind spots. What he's talking about here is our own psychological biases that cause us to make mistakes. Whether that's availability bias, which is, hey, What's available to me? What information is available to me? Oh, there's a lot of information about past returns over the last one year, three year, year to date, five year, 10 year on that fund. I have my list of funds in my retirement plan and the only information they really give me is the return history. Well, it's available. It must be relevant for me making my choices. And the truth is it's not that relevant for how you should be making your choices and developing your portfolio. There's recency bias where people forget things that happened 12, 13 years ago that were disastrous and they only focus on what's been going well the last year or the last two years or three years or the last three weeks in some cases. And there's overconfidence bias. You know, study that one, go back and listen to episode 18, the little book of behavioral investing by James Montier. Huge thing there where people get overconfident because they have lots of information at their disposal that builds their confidence and then Maybe that's the wrong information and they make mistakes. We're all susceptible to these blind spots. Back to the book. We believe what we tell ourselves. That can be dangerous. We should err towards humility since all investors get humbled. We talked about this earlier. Some of the greatest investors of all time, including Warren Buffett, have had multiple years where they've underperformed. Coming to terms with how much you don't know means coming to terms with how much of what happens in the world is out of your control. And that can be hard to accept. Think about market forecasts. We're very, very bad at them. 
I once calculated that if you just assume the market goes up every year by its historical average, your accuracy is better than if you follow the average annual forecast of the top 20 market strategists from large Wall Street banks. Our ability to predict recessions isn't much better. And since big events come out of nowhere, forecasts may do, no, may do more harm than good, giving the illusion of predictability in a world where for unforeseen events control most outcomes. New York Times columnist Carl Richards writes, Risk is what's left over when you think you've thought of everything. And I had a couple comments on this. A lot of times these big banks, these big research brokerage firms, investment firms, they're just pushing out content to push out content. It's, a mar it's part of their marketing program. It's not necessarily all very relevant to what's going to happen in the future. They're just trying to give people some level of comfort. Why? So that they stick with their thing. It, it all just boils down to just participate for as long as you can and stick with it and let compounding happen over long periods of time. When he's talking about big events that come out of nowhere, I got to agree. Uh, things like the dot-com bubble crashing. You knew it was building you. It was going to crash, but you know what we didn't see coming? 9-11, most of us. COVID-19 came out of nowhere. The subprime collapse came out of nowhere. No one realized what a house of cards that was, including the Federal Reserve, including the government. The oil embargoes in 1973-74, that came kind of out of nowhere and rocked the financial world. These big events come out of nowhere. So that means they weren't forecast. That means no one predicted they were coming. So go out of your way to find humility when things are going right and forgiveness and compassion when things go wrong. It's never as good or bad as it looks. So what can we control? We can control our savings rate. We can control our mindset. The other thing is we can control the risk of our portfolio. We just did a series on this. Go listen to episodes 21 through 24 on risk. Listen to episodes 9 call on mastering the basics of investing. Episode 19 on building an investment portfolio. And that'll help you get an understanding of what it's like to build a portfolio and control the risk of your portfolio. You can live beneath your means. Yeah. If you live beneath your means, you increase your savings rate. And these are all controllables. But again, what are we... Ask yourself, why am I doing all this? What's the point of all this if I'm investing my money? I just want to make money. No, I hope your life's bigger than that. I hope your life is more meaningful than that. Then I just want to make more money. Just remember, whatever your, whatever your goal is, your happiness will have some function of your results exceeding your expectations and the level of control you have over the world around you, especially your finances. So focus on controllables and increase the things you can control maximize the results by participating as long as you possibly can as much as you possibly can in the markets avoid ruin at all costs because if you could become financially ruined game over you're starting over and that's no fun and then keep your expectations realistic and even more conservative so that you increase the likelihood you'll have happy surprises so morgan Housel, if you're out there thank you so much for writing this book we'll continue to share it and uh, for the rest of you thanks so much for listening we'll see you next time once again, thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe. Please like. Please comment. Please find us on social media. We are at Fierce Fiduciary. You can also Google Fierce Fiduciary Podcast and find us anywhere. Dan, you're at from Facebook. I'm on Facebook. At Dan Alberth. Dan Alberth, And I am at Brian C. Beasley on most platforms. We also participate in some Facebook groups. If you're looking to have a deeper conversation there about various things, there's a group called Investing for Beginners. And then Dan and I host a group called Investing and Financial Planning that provides some educational and learning material. So once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.